so much, choir. And Reverend Henry Tyson, welcome home. We are glad to have you back. I'm so glad that Reverend Jennifer Gendrich explained the color of Lent, which is purple. Otherwise, I would have just thought that it was 40 days to celebrate Furman. <laughs> As it is, I'm so glad to have many a purple tie, all of which you will see in the next seven Sundays of Lent without repetition. Who here has ever been lost? Anyone? I've been lost a time or two. It brings about this word in my mind called confession. Let me have a little sidebar with my fellow guys out there. Is there any other confession that is less fun or less desirable to make than to say, Honey, I'm lost. I don't think there is. For to say such a confession just goes against our very nature. But if I haven't had to make that confession a few times in my life, it was in Chile, South America. Rebecca and I, well, I said to Rebecca, let's go out and explore the beautiful nature. So we went to Parque Abrece Andino, and there are the giant alerce trees, similar to the giant redwoods that are in California. We got in our little red truck and we went to a remote access point. I inquired about directions to the local park ranger. And I thought that I understood correctly. For he said, if you start here, the trail makes a large circle and you come back to the parking lot where you began. Okay, I said, honey, let's go. It was only after the first couple of hours that I began to worry that maybe I had misunderstood the Spanish that was spoken to me. I felt like if I misunderstood, Rebecca was in plain doubt. But I persisted forward, believing that just around the next bend, there would be the parking lot with our little red truck. I hoped against hope, but finally, hope was completely dashed as we came to a ravine. Beneath that ravine was a rushing river and the remnants of what was the bridge that crossed said ravine. It was there that I made that terrible confession, turning around and looking at the eyes of my beautiful wife and saying, Rebecca, I think we're lost. The sun was beginning to set beneath the tree line. We had walked already for some hours, and there was only one way forward at that moment, and it was backwards. And so I walking as fast as I could, Rebecca running because one of my steps equals two of hers, we went back through the Patagonian rainforest only to make it back to our little red truck before complete darkness set in over the valley. We survived that experience. We're still married today. But you know what? It gives us a little insight into how we view confession, doesn't it? Confession in this light is only when there's no other choice. Confession is also about saving face. And lastly, Confession is about admitting our weakness, but that's not really the confession that we're talking about today in the scripture that our brother Tommy Cox read from Romans chapter 10 verses 8 through 13. Paul speaks to the power of our confession in that when it comes from a right heart with a right understanding of God, it sets us forward to live correctly. For too long in the church, we have believed that confession is but an intellectual assent to a specific idea of who God is and what God does. But we never engage the far more immediate complications and implications that in fact, confession means how we're living in the here and now, 
In that spirit, I hearken back to the words of that Apostle Paul, the one who wrote to the church at Rome, a church that he longed to visit but never got to. He is giving them a history lesson. He's referencing the history of his own people in ancient Israel. And these are a people who were always in accompanying God along the way. They, through the law, believed that they had made the right confession, but had missed it ever so slightly. They, through the works of the law, believed that their righteousness was based upon their right action. And in so much, they became a people that were based upon self-righteousness, which is to completely miss the point. And though the words of God were given directly to Moses in the Ten Commandments and then later expounded upon in the Torah and later the Mishnah, these people had lost their way, not only in what they believed, but how they acted. Paul says that a similar phenomenon can happen to the early church that he writes to in Rome. For he warns that if you are trying to say that we can ascend to Christ, or if you are trying to say that we can descend to Christ, you are advocating a theology which is Jesus plus works. And that confession just doesn't make sense. The confession that Paul then says is correct for the early church as well as the church today is this, just Jesus, just Jesus. That in verse 9 specifically, Paul says that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that he rose from the dead, you will be saved. Now, that is a verse that I want to break down with you all here and now as we, as a people of God, return to the cross. And why shall we return to the cross? Well, it's a little phrase that I would like for us to participate in together. It's one that involves call and response, which I was told by a church member who shall go remain nameless, he was trying to help me out, that our church struggles a little bit with call and response. It was a sermon a few weeks ago that I invited you to say something with me, and it was a little bit more than awkward as it was kind of quiet out there. He came alongside of me and he said, Preacher, please give us another chance. I promise you we can do it. Well, we'll see. Because in this sermon, as well as every Sunday to follow, I want us to participate in the following. When the preacher says, if you want to embrace the empty tomb, the congregants shall respond, you must return to the cross. Okay, are you ready? (coughs) If you want to embrace the empty tomb, how sweet it is. And to begin that pursuit of the return to the cross, it is first and foremost our duty to have the right confession. It begins with the words, Jesus is Lord. What does that mean for you to confess that with your lips? Well, friends, it's far more than just having said a prayer. It's far more than just having raised a hand or walked an aisle in your childhood. No, to confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord is to say, I identify with Jesus. And Jesus had a specific destiny when he came here on earth. And that destiny, my friends, was the cross. For without the cross, there could not be forgiveness of sin. For without the cross, there could not be reconciliation with God Almighty. Without the cross, all hope would be lost. And as much as Jesus had the destiny of the cross so too do you and I. For in our experience in Lent, we must go to a place that beckons self-sacrifice, self-denial, and self-observation 
just like the cross did for Jesus. And in as much as we say Jesus is Lord, we proclaim boldly and honestly, life is not about us. A key contrast to the world in which we live, which everybody says, you do you know, not the Jesus way. The Jesus way says to you and to me that life is not about us. And so, friends, it also asks, what is life about? Life is about glorifying God Almighty. And there is no other way to do that that I have seen as a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ than to adhere to the teachings of Jesus. No, not as an option among many, but as the only option in obedience, friends, when we proclaim that life is not about us, we therefore say, Jesus, you as Lord are master of our lives. You know better than we do. And so in humble submission, we offer ourselves in obedience to you. It also says that the outcomes of living this Jesus life, the times that you will experience trial and travail are not horrible accidents. No, in fact, they are intended outcomes. That as you live as Jesus lived, yes, you will hurt as Jesus hurt. You will sacrifice as Jesus sacrificed, but in as much you will experience what escapes so many people in the here and now, an identity of who you were truly meant to be. Do you want to know the greatest tragedy of life? It's living it without a true significance. It was Thoreau who said, the great majority of men live lives of quiet desperation, but not within Jesus Christ, who says that if you will come and follow me, I will show you life and life to the full. Yes, it involves sacrifice, but oh, isn't the sacrifice worth it? So my friends, if you want to embrace the empty tomb, thank you, Tommy Cox. Now the rest of y'all, pick it up. <laughs> the also the part of the confession that beckons us to return to the cross is the second part of verse 9. It says that if you believe in your heart that Jesus Christ rose from the dead, you will be saved. Now when we hear the word saved so many times in the 21st century, the Christian mind automatically says, I will go to heaven one day which is true, but it also ins insinuates something about the here and now. That when we are saying that Jesus is alive, we are saved from ourselves. We are saved from living lives of triviality. We are saved from surrendering to darkness. We are saved from surrendering to selfishness. And all of that happens because of a great reversal which no one expected. When Jesus died a physical death on the cross, he was sealed in a tomb behind a heavy rock. His disciples, like the hash browns of Waffle House, were scattered, smothered, and covered. It was over, people. They didn't sit around the tomb saying, all right, here comes sunrise. Jesus is coming out in 10, 9, 8. No, it was over. And then when women had the courage to come and anoint Jesus' body with spices and oils, they had the great expectancy of seeing an empty tomb. Jesus was alive. The grave could not hold him. Death could not keep him. But that cannot happen until we first profess that Jesus is Lord to say in your heart today that he arose from the dead, to confess that, you must first start with the fact that he is Lord. And when you do, you can then experience that empty tomb of resurrection, which sets us free in the here and now. I far too often believe that Christians are too scared to be Christians. Why? 
because they don't realize the inherent power of cross, crucifixion, and resurrection. We've downplayed it in our lives, saying it's but an intellectual pursuit. What benefit, what good could it serve the world in the here and now? My friends, far more than you have realized. Without the cross and the resurrection, there would not be an open hands, would there? Without the cross and the resurrection, there would not be missionaries. Missionaries even now in the war-torn country of Ukraine that are giving safe harbor to people who are fleeing for their very lives, would there? And without cross and crucifixion and resurrection, we as a people of God would not be able to be here today and say, even though there is sickness and death, And even though there is tragedy, both personal and corporate, we proclaim still that God is good all the time, and all the time, God is good. Yes, my friends, I tell you for the last time, cueing you in to respond here in a few moments, that if you want to embrace the empty tomb, so my friends, that's exactly where we're going, returning to the cross here and now this Sunday and every Sunday that follows as a people of God. Journey with me, won't you? But don't mistake yourselves. For in missing the imperative confession, every part of your journey will be askew. Begin first with your lips saying, Jesus is Lord. It's not about me. It's about Giving glory to God and following the teachings of Jesus, come what may. And yes, my friends, it is about us saying that in our hearts, in the deepest part of our human conscience, in our soul, in fact, we proclaim that Jesus rose from the dead. And for that reason, we are saved for eternity, but we are also saved from ourselves in the here and now. Set free to do wondrous works in Jesus' name as the Church of First Baptist Carrollton. Oh, my friends, I ask each and every one of you today, what is your confession? And I hope for everyone here, you can come to the place where you say, if not in many words, but to just Jesus. Just Jesus. And if you have never made that confession, or if you've diluted that confession by thinking that it had to be Jesus plus something else, I want you today to return to the cross and say, just Jesus. Have thine own way, Lord, as I make these words of my confession. Mold me and make me, Master, I pray, here today, have thine own way. If that is your confession and you want to make it public, I ask you to come and speak with me. Perhaps today in the hymn that's soon to be sung or in the many moments that will follow. Come, speak to me. Let's talk about your confession. And today, if you would like to return to the confession saying, I once said it, but I never truly lived it. Today is your opportunity to return to the cross And to begin anew. Whoever you are, wherever you are, Jesus has something in store for you today as we as a people return to the cross. Would you stand? Would you join in our invitation hymn, Have Thine Own Way, as Reverend Tyson leads us?